about the security of the believer, about do you have security or do you not have security. This is a question that has been a problem to many, many people. It's it's been disputed and debated and talked about a thousand times over. And I know that as we get on to this that there may be a lot of questions. But I believe that this will answer it. I really do. This is God's answer. I've struggled over this myself, and these are the answers that God has given me through his word. First of all, the approach that I'd like to make at this, I'm going to present scriptures on both sides. And anybody who claims to believe in the security of the believer, once saved, always saved, as some people call it, they use certain scriptures. And then the other people use scriptures that are diametrically opposed. And whichever side you may have been on, there are scriptures that appear to be in direct contradiction to your stand and vice versa. There are scriptures on both sides of this issue. And there have only been two sides to this issue. People have either said either you're once saved, always saved, or, you're, or you are in danger of losing your salvation. You can be saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. And there's only been two approaches to this and two attitudes, one extreme or the other. Well, I believe that the scriptural position is a third position. It's not either one of these. <laughs> and if you'll listen to these scriptures and stay clear, you'll find that the scriptures on both extremes will harmonize and support a third position exactly. First of all, let's take scriptures like, for instance, simple ones that people have heard before that are, that are very powerful. John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, the very term right there, everlasting, implies that it is not something that passed away. It is everlasting life. In John chapter 10, verse 28, here's another very powerful scripture for the security of the believer. In John 10, 28, Jesus is speaking and he says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And that right there shows very clear that no man is able to pluck us out of God's hand. In other words, security. Also in Hebrews chapter 10, Verses 17 and 18, well, chapter 10 has a lot of scriptures concerning this same thing. We'll take a few. Let's start with verse 10. It says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. It says forever. In verse 17 and 18, it says that their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of, they, of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Also, a scripture goes right along with this, is Romans chapter 4, verse 8, and it's quoting, under, it's quoting an Old Testament scripture from Psalms 32 where David said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Not did not, but will not. Now that is strong. If you will take that and meditate on what that means, that the Lord will not impute sin or lay sin to your account. Also in 1 Peter chapter 1, Verses 3 through 5, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now that right there makes it pretty clear. It says that it is an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now these scriptures, there's, there's others, there's many more, and I'm not going to be able to get into all of these just simply because of a lack of time. But take, for instance, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's many, many, many others. And now on the other hand, there's a lot of other scriptures that would appear to counter and say just exactly the opposite of the scriptures that we've just read. Let's look in Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says in verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. 
Now, it has been said that this scripture right here is talking about a hypothetical case, or in other words, a case that is impossible to happen. It's just stressing a point that if it could happen, then it would be impossible to renew them to the repentance. Well, this is not just a hypothetical case. That is stretching the word beyond any limits that you can actually do. There are many other scriptures that go along and verify this, but that is not a hypothetical case. It means just exactly what it says. If you read the verses right after it, in verse 7, it says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain, and cometh off upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. And again, he's talking about the same thing he talked about just a few verses before. It is not a hypothetical case that he's talking about that if a person falls away, it's impossible to renew them again under repentance. Also in Hebrews chapter 10, it says right here in verse 26, it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now that right there is just seems to be in direct opposition to some of the other scriptures that we've used, ministering that it is such a thing, if you sin willfully, it is, impos- it is possible to reject that salvation. Also from 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, it says in verse 10, it says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, which, what's he talking about? Secure. Why do you have to give diligence? If it's a thing that automatically happens, why do you have to give diligence to make it sure? For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Why would he say that if you do these things, you shall never fall if there was no possible way that you could fall? Once saved, always saved. Also from chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, it says right here, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now again, right there, that is talking about a person who was saved. They have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but they were again entangled and overcome. The last end of them is worse than the beginning. This goes along with the scripture we ministered from Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, where it says that they had been sanctified by the blood of the covenant. It was not talking about a lost person. It was talking about a person who was saved. In Jude verse 24, it says... Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now why is it saying that he's able to do it? Why didn't it say that he's already done it? It's because it again is conditional. what exactly what that scripture looks like. From Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3, if you'd have to read this on your own, but it talks about to all of the seven churches it wrote to, it says, To him that overcometh will I give a crown to him that overcomes seven times it's only to the overcomers that are going to receive these promises of entering into the new jerusalem being able to be a partaker of the tree of life to rule the nations with a rod of iron even as jesus has received it's only to the overcomers also in colossians chapter one now this is a scripture that used to really give me some problems but i've since then seen the truth in it colossians chapter one verse 21 It says, in you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. But it is not a period, it's a colon. And the next verse says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, and made a minister. So right there, now that's the two sides, scriptures that seem to be in direct opposition. There is no opposition between them. They harmonize and they support the exact same thought. Now to explain this, I want to go into one more thing that has been said on the side of eternal security, never 
losing your salvation. And this is an argument, and it's a scriptural argument. It's based on the Word. And that is that you are saved by grace, not by works. From Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved, not, and that not of yourselves, it is a... I mean, excuse me. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so people teach that you're saved by grace, not according to your own works. From Galatians chapter 3, there's a scripture that says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? In other words, if you get saved by grace, what makes you think that you're going to keep your salvation by works? You can't do it. You've either got to be saved by grace and you've got to keep your salvation by grace, or you've got to be saved by works and keep your salvation by works. Well, the Bible makes it clear in Romans, especially, is a very powerful ministry on this, that no man is saved by the works of the law. In James chapter 2, it does say that faith without works is dead, that faith alone cannot save. It seems to be in direct contradiction to Romans, but it's talking about works of faith, not works of the law. In other words, your faith is the thing that saves, but faith has to be acted on. A person that says they have faith and is acting unbelief, they're just lying. They're just mouthing something. They're hypocrites, but it's not true. So faith alone saves, but saving faith will always have to be acted on. It'll have to have works of faith, not works of the law. There's a difference. And so there's a truth there that you are not saved by your works and you aren't maintained in your salvation by your works. God is not dealing with you according to what you deserve because if he did, nobody would be getting anything. I don't care if you're better than the next person. If you're better than somebody else, you're still short of God's perfect standard and if God dealt with you according to his perfect standards, you wouldn't be getting anything except hell. That's what we deserve. God's law is like a huge plate glass window. You could shoot a BB through that window and it would be broken. Or you could throw a grand piano through the thing and break it. It doesn't matter the size of the hole. It would be the fact that it was all one piece. If a BB broke it, it would be just as much broken and the whole thing would have to be replaced as if you were to throw a grand piano through it. Well, that's the way the law of God is. And there's a scripture to verify this in James chapter 2. The Bible says right here, it says that whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That's James chapter 2, verse 10. So you see, it doesn't matter if you consider it a big sin or a small sin. If you're doing just a small thing wrong, man may class that as being pretty good and maybe you can get your prayers answered. But the truth is that it doesn't matter if it's a big sin or it's a small sin. You have broken the law of God. You are guilty of the whole thing. Now, you might as well have been an adulterer, a liar, a cheater, a murderer, any of those things as to sit there and commit one small sin. And so, I don't care who you are, I don't care if you're living a better life than I am, you have not yet attained unto the perfection that the Lord offers. Paul said he hadn't in Philippians 3.13, and you still need to trust in the grace of the Lord and not get anything according to your own works. So people have taken this exact line of thought right there and said that it's impossible for you to lose your salvation according to your sin. Your sin's already been paid for. You aren't saved according to your works. You're saved according to the grace of Jesus. And therefore, it doesn't matter what you do, you can still be saved. You can go out and live like the devil and do what you want to. Well, there's a truth. And now I want to share with you what I believe is the scriptural answer to both of these questions. There's a truth that you cannot lose your salvation because of sin. Sin has been atoned for past, present, and future. Those scriptures that we've already quoted from Hebrews chapter 10 shows that, that our sins have been forgiven past, present, and future. By one offering we are sanctified forever, and, th and through the offering of Jesus, we, those whom he has sanctified, he has perfected forever. And so that means your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. They, God has to be able to forgive future tense sins if he didn't, our sins couldn't be forgiven because Jesus died 2,000 years ago nearly. He forgave us in advance before we had ever committed those sins. God is well able to forgive sins in advance. He's able to forgive past, present, and future. And so our sins do not separate us from God. Now there's a scripture in Isaiah 59 that says that our sins have separated between us and our God, but that was for a person who did not have the new covenant. That was for an Old Testament saint, and that was true. 
that sin did separate from God, but that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus broke down the middle wall of partition between us and God. He divided the veil and rent it in twain. There's no longer sin is a separation between us and God. Jesus bore it for us. Some people say, but sin's got to be judged. Sin's got to be judged. God hates sin. I agree with all of that, but what I'm saying is God judged sin in the flesh of his Son, according to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. It has been judged in the flesh of his Son, and God is not going to judge me for it. His Son performed a perfect sacrifice. He bore my sin so that I can come before the Lord sinless, holy, unblameable, justified, the word justified, a little simple definition of it, means just as if I had never sinned. That's my relationship with God. And so therefore sin does not break fellowship. And therefore the people who advocate once saved always say they have a partial truth, and that is that sin, you cannot lose your salvation because of sin. If you could, what are you going to class as the sin that makes you lose your salvation? Well, maybe you would say it was murder or adultery. Maybe you'd class it as one of these major sins. But again, I refer you back to James chapter 2, verse 10, that says if you offend in one point, you become guilty of all. And if you lose, I mean, if you commit one small sin, then in God's eyes, that's just as bad as committing these, these big sins, adultery, murder, fornication, all of these kind of things. And if you're going to be that way, well, then any one of those sins would make you lose your salvation. Where are you going to stop? Which sin is it that makes you lose your salvation? There's a scripture in 1 John that throw some light on this in 1 John chapter 1. It says, If we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So that right there makes it clear that this is talking to Christians. You read it. 1 John is written to Christians. It's written to born-again believers. The very next verse says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins. And so this is speaking to Christians, and it's telling them that if they say they have not sinned, they are a liar, and the truth is not in them. So if you're going to commit a sin, doesn't matter if it's a big sin or it's a small sin, it breaks the law of God, and if sin can make you lose your salvation, every person that's ever been saved has lost their salvation. And according to Hebrews chapter 6, if you'll go back to this scripture that we've already quoted, it says that if a person loses their salvation, it is impossible to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, there are some Pentecostals and other people who say that you can be saved and lost and saved and lost every time you commit a sin. If you don't get your sin confessed, if you were to die in sin, you'd go to hell. Well, they are just ignoring Hebrews chapter 6 that says that if you do fall away, it's impossible to ever renew you under repentance again. Now, that right there, that scripture says that it's impossible to be saved and lost and saved again. If you lose your salvation, you become reprobate, you become damned. There is no such thing as repentance to it again. So that knocks that in the head. Well, all right, now if the Pentecostals aren't right, what's the truth? Are you always saved? Well, now I want to say this. That sin, you cannot lose your salvation because of sin. The people who advocate eternal security are right in that respect, but what they forget and what they leave out is that you have a free will. And even though you can't lose it because of sin, you can reject your salvation. In effect, you cannot lose salvation, but you can throw it away. Now, if you will look at these scriptures that we first gave out when we first talked about this, you'll be able to see how these harmonize and support that situ uh, circumstance. Sin will not make you lose salvation. Your salvation is secure as far as sin goes. God gave you something that is powerful. It lasts. But you have to maintain the thing by faith, not by works, not by your own righteousness, but simply by faith. Let's look at this scripture that we quoted from, at the very first from... Let's see, 1 Peter chapter 1. And it says right here, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible 
and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Now, people take that scripture and they stop reading right there. And they say, now see, that talks about, boy, you are eternally secure. There's no such thing as losing salvation. Well, they've got a partial truth. It's not, you aren't going to lose it. It's secure. But uh, it goes on to say that you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, not through works, not through whether you live a holy life. Yes, you can commit sin and get the thing cleansed and, and out of your life, and that doesn't make you lose salvation. But if at any time you were to renounce the faith and just sit there and, and renounce it and say, I have nothing to do with it, I reject it, then... You could not lose your salvation, but you could throw it away. You could reject it. God did not force you to get saved. He does not force you to stay saved. Now, these scriptures from John that we read at the very first, if you'll read them now, this will help give some understanding here. In John chapter 10, Jesus spoke, and he said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, people teach that as sin. See, God locks you in his grip, and it's impossible to get out of it. It didn't say that. It says that it was impossible from anything from the outside to get you out. No man, no devil, Satan himself is not able to pluck you out of the Father's hand, but there is nothing in there that says that God will force you to stay in there. You have a free will. God never forced a person to get saved, and he will never force a person to stay saved. You can renounce it if you want to. And if you will begin to look at each one of these scriptures that we've read, John 3, 16, he gives you everlasting life. God's gift is eternal. He's not going to change, but you have a free will whether you want to continue in it or not. And according to John 10, 28, the scriptures we just read, John chapter 10, the scriptures we read out of them, and all of these others, you could just go on down, and they will harmonize this way. There is a truth on both extremes. The Pentecostals have said that you can lose your salvation, that you can be saved and lost. Well, they've got a partial truth. You can't lose it, but you can reject it. There is such a thing as rejecting your salvation. There are examples of it. Another example that I didn't give, but that certainly applies here, is about Judas Iscariot. The Bible calls him the son of perdition. And in John chapter 17, Jesus was praying to the Father about his disciples, and he said concerning uh, Judas Iscariot, he said in verse 12, John 17, 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Well, now Judas wasn't a born-again person in the sense that we are now. And yet, Jesus right there, he wasn't born again maybe, but he definitely was found because Jesus said that he became lost. Now, how could you get lost if you weren't found in the first place? It says that God gave him to him and that he kept him. In other words, he had him. Judas was one of his followers. Judas was a believer, and he lost it. He became reprobate. He rejected the thing. Now, he didn't lose it because of his sin. Judas, all of the disciples sinned. They had strife and bickering. One wanted to be greater than the other. Those things didn't make them lose it, but Judas rejected it. For what reason, I don't know exactly. But he was tempted, and he, became, he allowed Satan to use him to betray the Lord. And he rejected that salvation. He didn't lose it. Now, if you'll take what we've said right now, it'll really open it up, because you see there's a partial truth on both sides. The people who advocate once saved, always saved, say that you, you can't lose your salvation because your sin's been paid for. Yes, that's right. I agree that you can't lose it. Our sin has been paid for, and there is perfect security in our salvation. I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to be saved or not. I'm saved right now, and I know I'm going to stay saved. The only thing is that I have to make sure that I don't renounce the faith. If I sin, I'm not going to fall into condemnation and wonder about, have I lost my salvation? No, it's secure. My sin has been paid for. But I am at, at the same time not going to fall asleep. I'm not going to sit there and just go out and live like the devil because if I allow Satan to begin to have the dominion over my life, he's going to come and he's going to try and put me in a situation where I will renounce the Lord. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. If a per, Through persecution, if somebody was to put a gun to your head, and say to you, either you renounce the Lord or I'm going to kill you. You renounce your faith, say that it's of the devil, that there is no such thing as salvation, that there is no God, that you do not believe in Jesus or I'll kill you right now. 
only a Christian who is able to stand and had some things straight in their life would be able to hold fast to their profession. There would be a lot of Christians who would go ahead and sit there and renounce the Lord and put themselves above the Lord. And according to Hebrews 6, many other places, that would be rejection of the Lord and they would lose that salvation. And if you put yourself in a position where you continually sin, the Bible says in Romans 6, 16, that to whosoever you yield yourselves, he becomes your master. If you were out living a life of sin and you were saved, you may not lose your salvation because of sin, but that sin will be deadly. It'll come in, it'll begin to corrupt you. The Bible says that your heart becomes hardened through sin and you would harden yourself to the things of God. You would not feel the power and the anointing and the blessings of God flowing through you. And if you were put in a situation where somebody held a gun to your head, more than likely you would renounce your salvation. And so sin would have figured into the picture. Sin would not have been the thing that made you lose your salvation. It would have been your rejection of the Lord. It would have been your renouncing the faith. But sin certainly entered into it. I am not advocating that a person can just live in sin and do what they want to and make it. No, you need to live a holy life. You need to hate sin, but recognize that if you commit a sin, you don't lose your salvation. Sin can't make you lose your salvation. To verify this, look at David in the Old Testament. Committed adultery and murder, and he knew what he was doing. But when he was confronted with it, he repented. He had not rejected the Lord. He was somehow or another, however Satan did it, Satan got him to see he just operated in the lust of his flesh, but he didn't want to reject the Lord. And he repented, fell down and confessed it, and even after that time, God called David a man after his own heart. God did not throw him away. God still loved him and still dealt with him. And so there was a pretty gross, overt sin, and yet he did not let go of his faith. I want to share a scripture with you out of 2 Timothy concerning this. In 2 Timothy... Chapter 2, in verse 11, it says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance. Now this right here shows us something. It says in verse 13 that if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. This shows us that if you get into a position of sin, if you are sinning or any of these things, and yet you do not renounce the Lord, he will abide faithful. He will not deny you. He cannot deny himself. He has sworn that he would give you salvation, that it wouldn't be according to your works. And even if your works begin to go bad, God still loves you. God is still going to maintain that salvation. He's not going to let down his end of the bargain. But the 12th verse says that if we deny him, he also will deny us. And this denial that it's talking about is a rejection. It's not just a sin. It is a rejection. It's with your will saying, I don't want it. I reject it. And willfully becoming reprobate. And when you do that, God will have to uphold your decision. He will not force you to stay saved. He'll uphold it. You'll become reprobate. And according to Hebrews chapter 6, it will be impossible for you to ever be saved again. And so you see that right here it says that he won't deny us. He will never deny us as long as you hold your profession of your faith steadfast. Even if you get into sin, he's still going to claim you just like a father would his son. You're going to hang on even whether they're a good son or a bad son. Your love's unchanging. But if you deny him, then he will uphold your decision. Now let me first of all say this. According to Hebrews chapter 6, let's look at this scripture. There's some qualifications on this. Not everybody can just renounce the Lord. It says in Hebrews chapter 6 that it says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away. Now, it specifies a certain group of people. In other words, an immature baby Christian would not be able to fulfill this scripture. It says that, first of all, they have to have been enlightened. They have to have seen the truth. They have tasted, they have to have tasted of the heavenly gift made a partaker of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. In other words, there has to be a degree of maturity before a person can renounce this salvation. Now, an example of what we're talking about 
It's like I have a son, Joshua, that's four years old. Now, if Joshua was to get mad at me and say that I don't want to be your son anymore, I'm changing my name, I'm disowning you, I'm going to have nothing to do with you, I wouldn't allow him to do that because he does not understand what he's saying. He's not, he's not got his emotions completely controlled yet. He doesn't understand what it would be like to be on his own. He doesn't understand that a four-year-old can't make his own living and supply his own place to live and do everything. See, he's not accountable really for saying that, and the laws of this land would back me up. They would not allow him to go through the legal proceedings and get his name changed and no longer be my son because he's only four years old. They would uphold my position. He is not capable of doing that. But there comes a time, if he's 30 years old and if he was to say that same thing and want to change his name and do nothing, have nothing to do with me, there comes a time that if I was a godly type father, I would have to uphold his decision. I cannot dominate his life at 30 years old. If I hadn't got him in control by then, it's too late. I can pray and intercede, but I mean I could not force him to stay my son and the laws of the land would uphold his position, not mine. Well, it's the exact same thing in God's system. A Christian who doesn't understand what they were doing couldn't be guilty of this complete rejection and renouncing of the Lord. Again, I say you can't lose it because of sin. It has to be a willful act, and if they did it without really knowing what was involved in it, I don't believe God would hold them accountable because of this scripture here in Hebrews 6 that has listed certain qualifications. In other words, a person has to have done these things before they can be rejected in the Lord and not come back to repentance. And so I believe that that is a qualification that you need to make. Also, you can't judge the intents of a person's heart. If you would have looked at David, what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, if you would have looked at him, you would have thought, boy, surely he committed it. He willfully rejected God and everything to do with him. And yet, it shows by his action and by God's dealing with him that he didn't. And if you would have judged it carnally, you would have thought, surely that was enough to make that man reprobate, but it wasn't. So this is something that you need to leave up to God. But you need to be aware that it is possible and the the truth and what the Word has to say about it. But as far as you judging a person and saying, well, this person's committed that sin, they are reprobate, they've rejected the Lord. No, I don't believe that you have the ability to do that. If you were to operate in the supernatural gifts of the Lord, if he was to give you a gift of discerning or a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, that'd be a different thing. But it would have to be a supernatural gift of the Lord. I don't believe you can judge and put down a pat sin and say, this sin, well, if a person persists in this, surely this is the thing that means that they are renouncing the Lord, they are rejecting the Lord. No, I don't believe you can do it. I believe that you just have to simply be led supernaturally by the Holy Ghost, and that's something that needs to be left up to God's direction. Now, from Hebrews, the 10th chapter, let's go back and look at this scripture. We've already read this in verse 26. It says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, the emphasis there is not on the fact that if we sin. It says the emphasis is on the fact if we sin willfully. And again, this goes back and completely supports the statement that we've just made about a willful rejection of the Lord is what makes you renounce or lose that salvation. It's the willful part. Now, a person, the reason sin is deadly is because when you commit sin, you're allowing Satan to have dominion over you. You will activate lust in your flesh. And you can actually get to where you love sin and enjoy sin to such a degree that it could reach a point where God stops you and says, stop it, stop it, stop it, and you continually reject it. It could reach a point where finally the Lord says, stop it for the last time. And you sit there and you could be so bound in that sin and love it so much that you could say, well, if it comes to a choice between Jesus and between my sin, what I'm enjoying doing, I renounce Jesus. And it could come to that point. And if you ever do that, well then, that would constitute rejection of your salvation. According to Hebrews chapter 6, there would be no such thing as repentance. You would become reprobate. And I believe that that's exactly what Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 is talking about, that if we sin willfully, it's not just the sin, but it's the willful part. Now some of you may say, well, wait a minute, I've sinned willfully before. I've done things that I knew I shouldn't have done. I don't believe that that's what this is talking about. Because if you'll compare it with the scriptures in 1 John where it says that we've all sinned and that if any man says he has not sinned, he's come short of the glory of God. Well, every Christian's done that and yet the Bible makes it clear 
that if this was the willful sin that he was talking about that, that wound up in a rejection of your salvation and under the punishment of God, well, it would be impossible to renew you to salvation. That would mean that nobody was actually saved. All of us that have been saved, we've blown it and, and we wouldn't be saved. So I don't think that's what it's talking about. You may have done something knowing that you shouldn't have done it, but did you willfully sin to the point that I'm rejecting God? I'm going to sin and I don't care. I renounce my salvation. I'm no, going to hell and I just don't care. I'm going to go live for the devil. No, you didn't do it that way. You may have sinned through a weakness. You may have even known better and yet you found yourself doing it, but yet if you're a truly born again Christian, you do not enjoy doing that. You cannot have pleasure in that sin. And it was not a rejection of the Lord. You were not completely setting yourself against him. Praise the Lord. Now, the subject that we've ministered about today, this has been a very, very touchy subject. I know that it has. And I know that there's a lot of opposition. Some people, boy, will fight over this to the death. And I know that I may have stepped on a lot of toes and said a lot of things that are contrary. But if you will take what's been ministered, if you'll take these scriptures and analyze them, I believe that you'll have to come to the conclusion that we've talked about today. The, one of the prerequisites in studying the Word of God is that you've got to take the whole of the Word of God and make it fit together. The Word of God does not, does not contradict itself. And there are scriptures on both sides of this issue. There are the extremes that says, once saved, always saved. And then there's the other extreme that says, no, you can be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost. Now, there's scriptures that would go with both sides. And if you just try and pick certain scriptures and say, well, I'm going to believe this, you can do it and you can get into error. But if you will take all of these scriptures on both sides of the issues and sit down with them and sit there and say, I know that there is no contradiction the Word of God does not contradict itself. These things have to be complementing each other. They have to fit together. If you will do that, then you will have to come to this third position that we've presented today, and that is that, yes, your sins are forgiven once and for all, but your will is never done away with. You can willfully reject the Lord if you choose to, and if you do that, there is no such thing as repentance. You become reprobate and there is no way to ever regain that salvation. So it's important that you live a holy life, not necessarily to be pleasing to God. Jesus made you pleasing to God through his holy life. But you live a holy life so that Satan doesn't have dominion over you and so that you don't become hardened through sin and so that you don't put yourself in a position where you, through the weakness of your flesh, would renounce the Lord. Man, you need to guard yourself. You need to live a holy life and you need to continually upgird your faith and, and keep it stayed in the Lord. You need to hold fast the profession of your faith as Hebrews chapter 10 talks about. It's important and you need to understand this and it will also answer many questions out of the scripture. Again, concerning interpreting God's word, you've got to make these scriptures on both sides fit together. If you don't, you will come up with deception. It's the same thing with any doctrine of the Word of God. Take all the scriptures concerning it and make them harmonize. And if you can't make them harmonize, then sit there and say, I don't know. But don't take a stand and willfully ignore certain scriptures. I remember that when I first began to study the Word, Martin Luther, you see, he came out with this doctrine about the, the, by the grace you saved, and that's what sparked the, the um, Reformation. And tremendous things happened. Well, God did the same thing in my life. I began to see about how I'm saved by grace, and God isn't judging me and imputing my sins toward me, and it began to set me free. And then I began to read in James chapter 2 where it says, Can faith alone save? And the way that it says it, it just made it clear that no, faith by itself can't save. And it was in direct opposition to where in Romans chapter 4 it says, So we see that a man is saved by faith alone and not by the works of the law. They seemed to be in direct opposition, and man, I had a hard time with it. And finally, I read something where Martin Luther said that he didn't even believe that the book of James was scripture, that it was stuck in the Bible, that it wasn't ever supposed to be there. And when I read that, I thought, well, boy, that's the way I feel. I don't understand how James chapter 2 could be saying the same thing as Romans chapter 4. But did you know, as I kept studying God's Word and stayed with it, I found out that James chapter 2 harmonizes completely with Romans chapter 4. Because James chapter 2 says that it's with, that, with works of faith. 
If faith without works is dead, is what it says in verse 20, James 2, 20. Faith without works is dead. It says that Abraham our father was justified by works. In Romans 4, it says Abraham our father was justified by faith. They look like they're in opposition, but they aren't. It actually is talking about a work of faith, not a work of the law, but a work of faith. A work of the law is what Romans is talking about. In other words, by your own actions, by your own works, you are not accepted with God. It's by faith. But then James 2 comes along and says, yes, it's by faith, but it's got to be faith that's been acted on. A person that says they believe in God, or, or they acknowledge that there's a God, they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but yet has never made that profession with their mouth and has never made a commitment of their life to him, even though they believe the right things, even though there's faith present. If you don't act on it, that same person would go to hell because it's got to be acted on. Faith without works is dead. And so if you'll put James 2 together with Romans chapter 4 and study them, it actually complements each other. And it keeps a person from taking the scriptures in Romans chapter 4 and saying that it's just faith. As long as a person acknowledges and says that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and God raised him from the dead, I should be saved. Well, it takes more than that. You've got to do more than just say it. You've got to act it. Again, you aren't saved by your works, but you do have to act it to some degree. You can't just say it and go out and live for the devil and never act it. You have to begin in that direction. You may make mistakes. You may fall short. You may do a lot of things, but you have to add some action to your faith or that faith will never work. Faith without works is dead. And when you put them together, they harmonize completely. And praise God, you can get a depth and a maturity out of the word by making those harmonize that you would never have if you were to take one or the other stand and try and act on it without harmonizing the scriptures that seem to be opposite. God's word does not contradict itself. It reemphasizes itself. And if you'll stick with it and study and let these scriptures become alive, you'll find out that every scripture we've given concerning being lost and then concerning eternal security, that they will harmonize, that they'll fit together perfectly without any contradiction. And praise God, that is God's answer. You do not have to be fearful of losing your salvation because of sin. You can have boldness that even if you sin, you can come boldly before the throne of grace so that you may obtain mercy and grace to help in the time of need. You don't have to feel separated from God. But at the same time, don't get deceived. Sin is deadly, and sin, when you commit it, yields you to the devil. You need to turn from the thing and get away from it so you get out from under Satan's dominion because if you allow Satan to, he's going to put you in a position of renouncing the Lord, and it's deadly. Turn from it. Don't live in sin. Hate it. Abhor it. But at the same time, don't let sin have dominion over you because you will make mistakes. Get up and go again. Trust in the grace and in the mercy. Know that that sin's forgiven. But also, don't continue in it. Don't allow sin to reign in your mortal body. And I promise you, if you'll do that, like it says in Second Peter, if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. There's no reason that you have to wonder about, are you saved? Yes, I know I'm saved, and I know I'm going to stay saved because I've made a decision that come hell or high water, regardless if it cost me my life or anything, I am going to hold on to my faith in the Lord, and I know because of it that I'm going to have boldness at the appearing, at the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm confident of where I'm going, but I'm also aware that to keep that, I've got to keep my faith operative. I can't turn my back on the Lord and go my own way. I need to keep my faith alive. I need to hold fast the profession of my faith without wavering. Praise God. I believe that the Lord gives you understanding and that you supernaturally are able to receive this truth and that it will set you free. Praise the Lord.